here. Hi, th thanks. Um, so I'm John Kerr, the MOOC Manager and Learning Innovation Officer at the University of Glasgow. And I'm Vicky Dale, I'm a Senior Academic and Digital Development Advisor within the Learning Enhancement and Academic Development Service. Phew! <laughs> so we're going to just briefly go through some of the um, research that we've carried out about this sort of student transition from a free MOOC to a, a fee-paying uh, postgraduate certificate. Um, just to give you an overview of the MOOCs seen at Glasgow, um, we partnered with Future Learn sort of five years ago, so we've been with them um, for quite a long time uh, now. We've actually produced more than 25 courses since we put the slides together. We're probably closer to 30. Um, that's about four or five in production. Um, 300,000 plus learners enrolled into MOOCs. I know these numbers don't mean a lot, um, but we're still attracting sort of large numbers onto a lot of our courses. Um, the main things that we actually try and achieve is promotion for our MSc programmes, the distance ones uh, in particular, uh, research output. We also use MOOCs as part of our blended on-campus provision, where we allow learners uh, in class to take six weeks um, and take a MOOC online, and then they'll come back and do capstone assignments and so on and so forth within class. So it's sort of like a flipped teaching approach, but slightly different pedagogy behind it. Uh, partnership collaborations. So we've started partnering with other institutions, um, Deakin University, for example, where we're going to co-collaborate a, a MOOC together in a, a specialist area of uh, healthcare management. Um, we've also done other work with uh, uh, other uh, partners, such as the BBC um, and historic royal palaces. And Futureland becomes that platform that both partners can can use, and we're not relying on someone else's piece of technology like uh, Moodle or or something that another institution may use. Uh, and we also have the generalist courses, and these are just special interests that we, we feel that Glasgow has expertise in, uh, and we will push that out for the public to, to take. So a little bit about the project. So the, the course is a postgraduate certificate in art crime. Um, it was a course leader was Dr. Donna Yates. Uh, she actually won a Best Online Learning Student Experience Award at the University of Glasgow. And the MOOC served as a precursor to the course, so it ran uh, twice before our course, our PG set went live in the September. Um, and the course that we specific, specifically looked at attracted almost 11,000 learners. Um, uh, and you can see the sort of completion rates there. The standard postgraduate certificate, 60 credits, three courses, um, and we enrolled 30 learners onto that. Um, and it can actually lead into a face to face master's, which is within this uh, School of Arts. Uh, the MOOC is now on its ninth run, and it still does actually really well as a as a standalone as a standalone course. Um, sort of learner experience study, and, and Vicky's going to talk more about that in a second. Um, and we really focused on how the MOOC supported that transition from a free course to the fee-paying course. And Vicky will go on more about the sort of themes that we we, we looked at. So a typical screenshot of Futureland, which I'm pretty sure everyone is absolutely familiar with. Um, and what we used. The, the uh, screenshot on the right is from the course the academic used, um, used that presentation software for, for course delivery. Uh, and she used Slack chat an awful lot. We found learners, oh, sorry, Donna found learners that the Slack chat was uh, a great way of learners communicating rather than using middle forums, the sort of the notifications, almost like a sort of WhatsApp style communication channel. Um, and that's something that's been adopted throughout. So I'll go pass you on to Vicky. Thanks. Um, so just before we go on to the learner experience research methodology, if you haven't seen the introductory video for this particular MOOC, it's your opportunity to see John in his acting debut as an antiquities thief. So that's quite interesting. Please so. don't watch the video. <laughs> Okay, so we wanted to do learner experience research because we're really keen to know what about the student experience. Um, and we wanted to know particularly the experiences of the MOOC and how that transitioned into the PG cert. Uh, we were interested in, this was informed by the literature, um, how they prepared for the PG cert in terms of their foundation knowledge, which was quite varied. Um, their study skills, which again was quite variable, although a lot of the students were actual graduates, so they did already come in with a number of skills. 
for digital literacies, because obviously that's critical when you're engaging with students in the online space, and the readiness for self-directed learning. Because online distance learners, there's that issue of, of the loneliness, per perhaps not knowing how to manage their time online. So it's really important that they are self-directed and that they're engaged and supported in that. Um, and we also wanted to find out what else we could have done to support students as a team. Um, and what we did was we had semi-structured interviews planned, and of the nine participants, seven of them were actually recorded, audio recorded, um, face to face interviews. Two of them um, were uh, filled out as interview pro formas in a written format, and that's because we had some international student participants and they felt more comfortable engaging in the study in that way. Um, so we combined that data, and obviously we got ethical approval to gather the data from our learners at the start. So we used thematic analysis to be able to analyse the data, identify the themes, the sort of commonly occurring patterns and what the students were telling us. So Eva Kubinkova and myself hand coded all the transcripts. John looked at a sample of these and then we had conversations. I think we had a couple of conversations yeah. just to tease out what we all agreed were the main um, themes and patterns. Um, and the main themes were as follows on the slides. That the MOOC, um, as you would expect, stimulated enrolment onto the PG cert. It enhanced their preparation for this online distance learning credit bearing course. One of the things that came out that was critical, and I think that's a point for discussion that we really welcome later, is the importance of the lecturer. Um, and also there were challenges and suggestions for improvement because um, the MOOC can help in some ways to support the learners into this credit bearing course, but, but there are still issues that you know, we couldn't anticipate. So what we're going to show you is a series of quotes. So we're not going to um, read them out to you, but they are on the slides and they will be available online and slide share afterwards. We might just pick out some key themes, um, key points for, to highlight that. So in terms of how the MOOC stimulated enrollment for the PG cert, it raised the student's awareness. It confirmed their motivation and interest in the topic. So one of the issues about online courses is they may start it and then once they've already started, they've paid their fees, they find out this isn't really what they thought they were buying into, and um, so that leads to drop out. This is a good way to alleviate that issue. Um, Self-efficacy, so being able to study online, um, students felt more comfortable and more confident about that too. And then finally, recognising the value of online learning. Um, the student had had previously very bad experiences of online learning and it was actually quite cathartic for them to realise and empowering for them to realise that online learning could be a good thing. It could be inclusive, it could engage the learner. Okay, is that enough time to read them? Just, kind of? Okay. Um, and then in terms of how the MOOC enhanced their preparedness for the PG Cert, um, we talked about foundation knowledge. So there were people on this um, course, we had art historians, we had archaeologists, there were people from the police force, um, so, and, and from international backgrounds as well. So the students all came in with, with very, it's almost like jigsaw um, pieces combining their knowledge together, which was a good thing, but it did mean that the MOOC provided the opportunity to, to align everybody, calibrate their foundation knowledge. So that was good. Um, digital literacies obviously prepared them for engaging in the online learning space. And then study skills. It didn't give them new study skills as such, uh, maybe some advanced study skills as we mentioned later on, but generally it just kind of reinforced what they'd already developed. Um, we did have some really incredible people on this course. I see we am using the Royal We Donna mm -hmm. course, of course. Um, but we had there was writers of fiction. Um, there was a whole range of different people. They were an incredible bunch. Yeah, definitely. And then readiness for self-directed learning. Just give you a second to have a wee look at that. Yeah, it's a bit scary. If you don't keep up, you're going to have to pay a price for it. So I obviously learned through the MOOC that they had to manage their time effectively. And then the importance of the lecturer. So enthusiasm. Donna lives and breathes her subject. She is the, the best digital scholar I've ever seen online on Twitter. Um, she, she has an incredible number of followers, doesn't she? And she's got about three Twitter accounts. She's in the tens and tens of thousands yeah. now. Yeah, and she lives and breathes her discipline. And I think that comes across so clearly to her students, um, which is a wonderful learning experience. You, you can't put a price on that. 
Um, and then very much the sort of idea of teacher presence. So Donna was there, she was, even though it was an online course, uh, the MOOC was obviously online and the, the PG cert leading into it was online, Donna was there, she answered questions. And, and the comment about support, the level of helpfulness that she brought to it. So it wasn't just that she was fielding academic questions, she was also dealing with technical issues as well. We had students who were struggling to get into the library to rent out books or, or get e-books, that sort of thing. Um, and Donna was keen to engage with that. She went over and above. That was a small number of students. I don't know how sustainable that is in the long term as your student numbers grow. Um, but she was just an incredible support to the students. And the learning design as well, and we'll say a wee bit about that shortly. Um, that basically, it, it, the way that it was designed just made it so that students wanted to do this course. Just to give you a bit of background, so, so Donna was involved in discussion forums throughout the, the, the MOOC, but we also had two GTA students who would also facilitate discussions, and anything that they couldn't answer was passed to, to Donna. So Donna would dip in, but she was there at a high level, uh, and and at a more personal level with answering some of these. Mm -hmm. uh, I couldn't give you an estimate of how much time she spent on the, on the, the, the MOOC, um, but I would imagine it was maybe about an hour a day. That's probably where she'd have been at, probably more, but yeah. However, there were challenges, as we noted. So in terms of the challenges, as I said, this was an incredible bunch of students. Um, and so we had one saying that they wanted to engage with course material beforehand. So they would have liked more academically challenging content. Um, we talk a lot about assessment and feedback. Uh, one student or a couple of students felt that um, academic writing, it would have been good to have some more formative experiences um, within the MOOC to prepare them for what was happening in the PG cert. But you've got to balance that with the fact that the MOOC is designed at quite a low level generalist for, for ever, generalist levels. Yeah. And then advanced study skills, so being more um, challenging, you're scrutinising um, uh, sources a little bit more carefully came up. In terms of other challenges, we had some technical issues, not technical issues, but challenges in terms of students engaging with the Glasgow platform. Did yeah. you want to say a few words? It's just that the alignment between future learning your in-house VLE is, is, is quite radical because of the tools that Moodle offers compared and Blackboard offer compared to what future learn. So learners actually really do still like that very simplistic linear view um, of the of the learning, whether within Moodle everything branches off to sort of somewhere else. Um, so I think the, the struggle for us internally is how we can actually aesthetically make Moodle not look like future learn, but take some of those principles that learners are telling us that they like about mm -hmm. it. And, and then use it within our, our own course design. Yep, and the trade-off with that is having the extra functionality in Moodle, of course, so yep. it's, yeah, definitely. English is a second language, so we had international students on this course, um, and one student loved the chat sessions, but they participated in a different way. Um, so they, they commented, but they um, didn't want to, to talk, uh, contribute to the audio feed, um, because they were still building up their vocabulary and their confidence um, in learning uh, in English. But they still felt fully involved. And then other people um, commented that in terms of online study, maybe more signposting, more explicit signposting about what they were expected to do in the time frame for that would have helped. And that's some feedback we've taken on board that we, we advise academics about. So we've got a paper accompanying this and we used um, Garrison's community of inquiry model as a lens in which to present the results because we really felt that in terms of Donna's contribution, the teaching presence was very much highlighted. The cognitive presence was very much highlighted in the learning design and the social presence was very much highlighted by the fact that we had this um, course that was underpinned by a constructivist um, pedagogy as well. So this is Donna, she's at an ABC learning design workshop. That was before we got the glossy cards, so it was a bit rough and ready back in the day. Um, but she was one of our first adopters of the ABC learning design uh, method that came out of UCL. Uh, and as you can see, she looks quite happy to be using that to design her course. And I'll let you read this out. So Donna gave us permission to share her experiences with you.
And I think that's what's really empowering is the fact that when students do engage with us in terms of online learning, the MOOC and the PG Cert, it doesn't just inform the practice as an online educator, which John mentioned she won an award for, but actually informs all their learning and teaching. So that's really, really empowering. And if you want to hear more about Donna's experiences, um, if you haven't read about her in the papers already or follow her on Twitter, um, there's a talk there as well. There's also, that was our, our bold showcase event, Blended Online Learning Development Project Showcase, and Sheila did the keynote for that as well. So there's some really interesting stuff in that. Back to John. Uh, so I'm just going to sort of recap with some of the future developments that we see at Glasgow. Um, the, the, the next step for us is definitely a a sort of MOOC strategy, whether that is a wider um, open educational strategy or we just go quite narrow and focus specifically on MOOCs is, is still to be determined. But we definitely have to set out markers of where we want to go with this in the next three to five years. It's become such an essential part of what we do at Glasgow now. Um, it really is this, it's going to start to be embedded more mainstream into our day-to-day our -day learning and teaching rather as a separate entity. Um, we want to increase our output um, to be in line with our online degrees. So if we offer a, a master's or a postgraduate certificate, then a MOOC should definitely precede that um, for all the benefits and highlights that we've sort of that we've just mentioned. Um, within Future Learn, our short-term focus just now is on the sort of credit-bearing programmes where we can offer sort of short pieces of credit for learners if they take a sequence of MOOCs um, for somewhere in the region of maybe 10 to 15 credits or something along that line. Again, we see that as a natural progression from a MOOC to a, a full uh, postgraduate certificate or master's, and it gives them that middle ground that maybe brings some of the challenges that the learners were talking about, and it might actually help us with that going forward. Um, and we need to look at the demand internally. It's growing. We get requests weekly for new, for new MOOCs. They need to be aligned to sort of different strategic uh, goals. Um, and we need to put people in place to support us. So, you know, academic developers like Vicky, the media production and development team, and so on and so forth. Um, and the future direction, MDMF. So, MDMF is a framework that has been created at Glasgow. Um, again, we have a, a paper on that as well. And effectively, this builds on the, the UCL ABC approach, but actually takes it online and is, is for uh, MOOC curriculum development. So at the left hand side you have a linear structure that you would expect to find on FutureLearn where you just see everything all on the one page. You've got timings per activity which the students picked up on and then we've got some of the more common um, activities within our MOOC, so videos, articles. They get mapped out and then at the end it all gets mapped onto the learning types and we have a look and as a non-subject specialist it allows learning technologists to have that conversation with academics, look at the original course ILOs and aims, and then we can have that discussion of, well, should we have more production in this course? That was the original aim, but we've, we've went a little bit too video heavy, which is often the case. Let's start adjusting some of these activities. And how that looks once you've had that conversation, it looks like this. It's, it's, a, it's a, a free tool called Real Time Board, and it allows multiple collaborators. And the good thing about this, as, as it's an, an enhancement and an extension to the ABC approach, with it being online, once you've had an initial meeting with an academic about their MOOC curriculum, this is online and anyone can go back in and start rejigging things and everyone sees the most up-to-date version. With the ABC approach, at the end of that session, you sort of take a picture and then you're working off of, of, of that sort of medium. And it's, it's not ideal going forward. So I've enhanced it and we've, we've created this uh, framework. Um, and this is Creative Commons licensed, and you can actually go, um, you can actually go online and, and get all that. If you just search for MDMF Glasgow, take it and use it, and there's all the instruction guidelines and everything else. As Vicky alluded to earlier, we have a paper on the transition work accepted by Alt Journal. We just got the email about proofreading the final copy, so that should be done in the next day or so, um, and that will be published in the Alt Journal in the coming uh, weeks. Some references if you want to have a read, but um, that is us. Thank you for listening. Okay, we still have time for questions. Anyone want to ask before I go on to me too to look at some of them? Yeah. Okay, while well, you're thinking about it, let's just go on me too then. Uh, so I've got three questions here. The first one, how more engaged were the students when using Slack compared to FutureLearn? And was it used for text-based comments or interactive engagement? 
That's a very good question. It's a very good question. It's actually going to be quite hard to answer that because yeah. the comments on future learn are in the thousands, but the quality of the comments um, is quite difficult. Yeah. I, I couldn't tell you that sort of okay. standing here. But for the 30 students that take the postgraduate certificate, mm -hmm. they use Slack throughout the, the, the three courses. And Donna only reported positive um, mm -hmm. highlights yeah, from it. Um, it's the immediacy of the comments and the way they're threaded. And mm -hmm. Moodle, it's, it's, it's different. It's, it's 30 minutes of post. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's not synchronous in that respect. There is all these delays and restrictions. Whereas the Slack gives you much more of a, a WhatsApp mm -hmm. style mobile chat. Mm -hmm. So um, oh, it's hard to actually yeah, answer that one, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. That's fine. I hope that's helped. Uh, the next question actually is on about Donna. Um, how does she manage her time to support the MOOC, uh, for example? Does she have advertised um, online office hours or is it more ad hoc? So for the MOOC, no. Uh, there, is, there was no um, official rules of engagement. Effectively, we would ask academics to just give as much time as they can. Mm -hmm. And we would normally say somewhere in the region of maybe about half hour a day. But that's fronted by two GTAs who would help guide and facilitate discussions. And then the academic would um, come on for that half hour, look at the main themes and topics, and then, and then answer them or, or, or further, guide, um, further guide those discussions. Yeah. Uh, Donna being Donna just couldn't tear herself away from it. So she, she probably spent hours on it. And then she told me before she'd been up all hours at night, two in the morning, reading through comments, because it's so personal as she's built that course. Um, it's you know it's, it's her baby, so it's, it's difficult for yeah. for you to, to detach, yeah. and and that. But we don't advocate that an academic spends that amount of time on a, a MOOC. No. But I think just to pick up on that, um, Donna was I think the fact that it was online the course she mm. could be completely flexible. So as you can imagine, somebody who's just a scholar like that, mm. she's got so many travel commitments because she's still doing all sorts of archaeological research, yeah. research and things as well. Um, so I think it being online it gave her that flexibility yeah. to engage with her students. Um, and she never missed a class and she had um, she, she like Google Live sessions and things as well, didn't she? Yeah, Google, Google well, Hangouts. Yeah. You, YouTube yeah. Live sessions uh -huh. now, yeah. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. Okay. Um, one more question. Um, I find that engaging with students online can be very time intensive. Did the students expect timely responses or, again, was it more office hours? So it's more the expectation of it that they just expect her to just get on with it and answer my question. Yeah. And I think that. probably um, Donna was successful at establishing a really good rapport with her students okay. and engaging with them before the course leading up to it and through that whole transition period. So I think she'd already established a rapport and a kind of protocol for what was appropriate in terms of communication. Right. Okay. But I think that's, you know, what you said there is really important. Mm -hmm. I think setting um, clear expectations yeah. for what you can do as an educator because you can't be there 24 exactly. hours a day. You know, you've got, they've got to... Their, their own well-being is important as well. So You don't want uh, an academic to answer a question as soon as it's asked either because you can then, you, be sort of, you put out the flame before it starts to burn and yeah. you want other students to that chance to collaborate or to put forward their uh, interpretation of the direction of the answer. Mm. Um, so usually a day or two, unless it's, uh, this is broken, I can't fix it. Um, but if it's a general question, sometimes it's good to let that discussion happen organically before mm. someone comes Jumps in. in. Yeah. Um, any more questions? No? Okay, I think we'll call it there then. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you.